So I'm Jonathan. I'll speak a bit slowly so that everyone, so that everyone understands. I'm a lawyer from Israel. I work with the Israeli Bitcoin Association and a few other Bitcoin startups from Israel and from other places. Um, most of my clients do not do ICOs, but some of them do. And what I want to show you today is all about the legal work that people do before and after they go to an ICO and what happens if you don't do this legal work, what happens if you want to just go and do an ICO with no lawyers, which should be the best thing to do, but it's not. And we'll talk about later, if we'll have the time, about the Israeli community, because what we have in Israel is very special. We had uh, the guys from Bancor that I don't know if you've uh, invested there or know these guys. We have the Coindash guys. We have people developing. It's a Bitcoin hub and a blockchain hub from all over the world. And there's very interesting things going on. And if you happen to be in Israel, don't forget to ping me. I'll introduce you to all the relevant guys. So I want to start with this guy. <coughs> So, let's try again, and if not, then we'll do it without. Okay, so, ignore this. Back in uh, 2011, 2012, there was only this guy who used to work as a Bitcoin exchange. I don't know if you've heard of Mark Carpellis, the guy from MD Gox. Back in uh, 2006 or 2007, Magic the Gathering online exchange, MTGOX, was set up <coughs> to help people, geeks like you and me, exchange cards for the game Magic the Gathering. It didn't turn out that well, so they changed it around 2011 into a website that allowed you, let's see if it works now, that allowed you to exchange bitcoins. And they used the same domain name. Mark just happened to be there and buy the domain from another guy. He wasn't the actual owner. But that was the way you could change bitcoins. Now I really need to try again. So let's see. Never trust technology. <laughs> <laughs> so. OK. So back in 2012, there was this guy, and he set up a website that allowed people to gamble over Bitcoin. It had a very interesting, unique uh, character, which was that it was a smart contract, and I mean that it got payment, and then it generated a random number, and if the payment uh, or the random number was about a specific threshold. It sent the person who paid to that address another payment with another reward. If it was below the threshold, no reward was sent. Meaning, meaning you had a gambling contract. You had to trust the guy who operated <coughs> it, of course, but it worked. It worked because that smart contract was made over the blockchain, over Bitcoin, and you could see the percentage of winnings over time. Uh, this guy set up this website. He, s he told the guys on Reddit that it cost him around 45 Bitcoins to operate, back then $450. And he said, uh, I'd like to sell this because I've made enough money. I've made something like, well, he said, I've made 146 bitcoins off of it. Let's see if it works again. Because yeah. 
So he said, I made $146 off of it. This was five years ago, 2012. That's enough for me. Does anyone want to buy it? And a guy named Eric Voorhees, Eric with a K, always Eric with a K. Please note the difference between Eric with a K and Eric with a C. Eric with a K sometimes referred to the evil Eric. He <laughs> said, I'd like to buy it from you and set up a website. He changed the name and called it Satoshi Dice. It was very simple. Every person who wanted to bet just got their own Bitcoin address to send their money to. And when they sent it, to that address, they would get most of their money back. You had a 70% chance of winning the dice, which means that in 7 out of 10 times, you'd get your money back plus something, and 30% of the time, you'd get lost, the money would get lost. You'd have a 90% dice, you had 10% dice, and the percentage of winning was dependent. But that wasn't enough for Voorhees. He operated a profitable business, and he said, I want more. Early 2013, Voorhees walks on to BitcoinTalk.com and says, well, I want to sell shares in my business. This is not an incorporated company. This is not something that goes to a stock <coughs> exchange because, well, gambling is illegal in most states and requires licenses in others. But you can buy one share for it was something like um, 0.1 Bitcoin, the sum then, and you can get your own share in Satoshi Dice. It wasn't that profitable. People on Reddit calculated and said, well, to get my money back would take something like 10 years in Bitcoin, because for each share I buy, I get only 0 .001, 0 0.001 Bitcoin per year. This isn't profitable, but Bitcoin back then already did tenfold for people who bought Bitcoin back in 2012. You have to remember, 2012 Bitcoin went as high as, I think, two or three dollars. And in 2013, early 2013, we were at 50 or 60 dollars, going straight onto the 70 dollar margin. People wanted more because the, the amazing return you could get for doing tenfold on the Bitcoin wasn't enough. So they said, well, I'll invest, I'll get interest over the interest I already get in Bitcoin, and everything will be fine. That kind of worked. It took almost a year, and Voges suddenly goes online and says, well, guys, I found someone who wanted to buy out everyone of Satoshi Dice and make a huge exit. Each and every one of you gets their money back plus some kind of interest. Because of the changes in the Bitcoin rate, it was something like uh, a two times or three times return, and they made an amazing profit. The only problem here was, well, no one knew the identity of the buyer. No one knew exactly who owns the new shares or who owns the companies. And no one knew that there was, this was kind of tied up to a press release issued a few weeks before by the Securities and Exchange Committee. They said they'll be going into investigating Bitcoin investment agreements. Now, it took almost a year and a half, and Voorhees was indicted and admitted to wrongdoing. He paid a fine, a terrible, terrible fine of $85,000 for making something like 400 bitcoins worth of profit off the investors. Now, when everything broke, Bitcoin was 10 or $15. Uh, when he got fined, Bitcoin was, uh, I think, around five or $600. So you should understand that the fine of $85,000 is nothing. But that wasn't only the only case that the Securities and Exchange Committee in the US investigated. The second one is more interesting. Back in 2015, uh, after the launch of Ethereum, people decided to set up an investment fund over the Ethereum blockchain and call it the DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. We don't need people. We can write the smart contract by ourselves. We'll do the investment with the smart contract. 
people will vote, people will decide, but it's the common wisdom, it's everyone's work, that will definitely work. They raised $110 million only to find that a bug in their software caused the glitch that allowed the president to withdraw almost everything. This, I don't know if you remember, caused the fork, the hard fork in Ethereum to Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, a rollback to give everyone their money back, but it also caused another thing. The US Securities and Exchange Committee decided to investigate and to see whether this investment was in a scam or not and whether it should be fined or regulated. And they found that, well, the DAO was indeed an investment contract. An investment contract is something that is regulated both under US law and Israeli law. And what is an investment contract? Well, for that we have to roll back 70 years to Florida and to a plantation of oranges. <laughs> Mr. Howie had a lot of plantations in Florida that grew oranges. And I know it's not that technological, but he said, well, I have enough orange trees for myself. Let's take some lands and sell them to other people. But I know that that guy from New York that bought a few acres off of me can't fly back to Florida every month, harvest the oranges, water the trees, make sure that someone buys them. So I'll offer him an agreement for management services. When I offer him the agreement, he'll sign and we'll split the revenue. I'll sell his oranges, I'll water his trees, I'll make sure no one trespasses, and everything will be fine. This kind of worked because the Securities and Exchange Commission went ahead and told them, well, Mr. Howey, your agreement is an investment agreement. You're not just lending people or selling people land and then giving them services. You're offering them an actual investment. What is an investment? Well, it has a few criteria. And an agreement that meets all of these criteria is considered an investment agreement and therefore needs to have a prospectus, needs to be registered, and the securities by themselves need to be traded in a, an actual exchange. The first is that there's actual investment of money, meaning that if you don't invest money or money equivalent, then there's no securities, there's no investment agreement. But if you invest money or your time, which is money, into a project, then it is an investment agreement. The second, which is very important, is that you expect to gain profits. If you put down your money and don't expect any return, and the actual way that the investment is formulated, you're just throwing money away, it's not considered an investment agreement. The third, is that this is a joint endeavor. It's not just one person investing money in a, in a company. It has to be something that is made out to the public, to an unspecified group. In US law, more than 35 people a year. And that all of this is conditioned on the managerial efforts of another, meaning that it's not the people in the actual group that bought the investment agreement that have any influence on whether there's profit or not. It has to be dependent on others. Now, when all these criteria meet, this is an investment agreement. Most ICOs do fall here, but there is a few that don't. And I want to talk about a few that don't and how you can, when you want to do your ICO, fall outside the Howey test. The first, that is, actually not profitable for anyone planning on gaining money from their ICO <coughs> is to give away the tokens. If you give tokens away for no actual investment of money or no payment of money, then your, the Howey test is not met. This is called, in technical terms, airdropping. For example, you say, we duplicate the blockchain and for everyone holding one Bitcoin, He'll have one master coin. This is what you could have done when you issued 
the master coin, now Omni Network. This is done in a few projects that tell you, well, we'll airdrop a few uh, tokens for a currency and everyone that has an Ethereum wallet, he'll be able to use it. The second is that there is no expectation that the value of your token will grow. Think about uh, an Israeli startup called Lazuz to move. Lazuz was a ride-sharing application that did an ICO. They failed, but the staff today are working with a few ride-sharing apps all around the world doing great stuff. Their project was as follows. Each token is worth one kilometer of ride-share. If you're a driver, you will get one token for each kilometer you drive a person. If you're a passenger, you pay one token for each kilometer you uh, drive with a driver. Meaning, the token's value is actually one kilometer. There's no reason that a token will double its value or triple its value over time because the price of a token is actually <coughs> attached to the price of driving. <coughs> it's something that's common. It's something that's not meant for profit. The way you make tokens is by driving. The way you sell tokens to others is if they want to write yet. No expectation of profit, meaning no security, no investment agreement. Also goes for uh, decentralized projects like storage, Filecoin, MadeSafe, I don't know if you've heard of them, storage solutions, meaning for every megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte you store, you get one token. When you want to purchase storage space on other servers, you pay with this token. There's no actual expectation that the price of storage will increase over time. Actually, it decreases. So, no expectation of profit, no need to be concerned. The third is to make it not a group effort, meaning something small. The tokens will be distributed to a small amount of people who will use them later on. It doesn't have to be a thousand people, it should be something like 10 or 15 people that use these tokens. They can maybe later sell them, not in the initial distribution, but later on. This has not been tested by the regulator and I wouldn't use it as a test case. And the last thing is to take out the managerial efforts from another back to the token holders, meaning that each token has its own value. And each token has different meanings in different environments. Think of land. Think of your token as representing a specific lot in Paris. Different lots in Paris, different buildings have different value. Real estate prices differ from acre to acre, from house to house, and sometimes from one apartment to the other in the same building. Now, in this case, where each token represents one specific apartment, one token can increase in value while the others decrease. Or the changes in value aren't dependent on the managerial efforts of another, but on how you used your property and how you used it to make everything better and make your time or token better. Now, this ICO hype, because everyone wants to do an ICO, is not something that's that healthy for the blockchain and Bitcoin community. Putting a lot of money helps. Putting a lot of money brings new people inside. But most people say, well, I know that there's regulation. I don't need regulation. I'm an accredited investor. But they forget that all these laws that are meant to protect people are there because people lost their money. Most investment agreements that you'll read in ICOs say something like this. We have no plan on how our token will work. We don't know whether it actually works. We're only committed into giving you one useless token that we're not sure could be traded, could be exchanged for something, or could work with our technology. And therefore, we're not liable for anything. I know a few people who actually read this, these agreements. I'm one of them. I write them for a living. I read them for a living. But unless you read both the smart contract itself and understand how the token you buy works, 
and understand the legal structure that you invested into, investing in ICOs is highly speculative and highly, highly technical and unrecommended. I would not do that unless I know the team, know how the technology works, and know that they won't run off with my money. Think of all these pre-sale ICOs that happen. People just sent money to an Ethereum address and expected to get tokens back. And has anyone here heard of Coindash, an Israeli startup? Do you know what happened there? Yeah. Okay, so Coindash has a di distributed exchange for tokens. Nice project, very nice ideas. The problem is that Coindash's website was hacked on the moment they started the ICO. And the Ethereum address showing up on their website was wrong. Someone sent, it, it, it wasn't someone, the investors sent something like six or ten million dollars of Ethereum to the wrong address. People lost their money because of a simple hack. Now, the guy returned off most of the tokens last week. Uh, nobody knows who this guy was, nobody knows why he stole it, but the money was returned at the end. However, it, it's not certain that this will replicate itself in the next hack. Um, if you don't trust these guys, you won't get your money back. A lot of people thought they lost most of their money because someone puts down 100,000 euros for an investment and has let's say 200,000 euros in Ethereum, loses half of his property in this ICO. <coughs> now, what goes on currently in Israel is that the regulator, the Securities Committee, is investigating into ICOs and they want to enable it. They want to enable it because they know that ICOs means more tax money going into Israel. If the ICO is regulated, people pay taxes in Israel, People come to Israel to do business, it's good. It's good for entrepreneurs, it's good for startups, it's good for the public, we're okay. But they want to put safeguards. Safeguards that will protect your investment. I don't know exactly what's going on in French law today, but most likely that your regulators want to regulate in order to protect you. Don't think of your regulators as troublemakers. Think of them as people who are unaware of what's going on and it's your role to help them know what's going on and to make them aware to enable these ICOs on one hand but to protect everyone on the other. Uh, we'll open up for questions. We have half an hour for questions and I'm here to help and I assume that later on everyone can have uh, meaningful conversation, even in French. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Is there a country where uh, regulation is already done? There are a few countries that have draft regulations, and you can say that the U.S. already has regulation that says no, no ICOs allowed unless you go to a stock exchange, whatever. Um, actually, AngelList did uh, CoinList uh, uh, did uh, a template for documents for doing an ICO for accredited investors, which is uh, according to the U.S. Angel Law, the Jobs Act that allows you to participate, but it's only for accredited investors, only for people who are worth over $2 million and have uh, a yearly revenue of over 300000 I know that Gibraltar has a draft on guidelines that actually gives you a sandbox. Mm -hmm. The UK's FCA will most likely give an, a sandbox as well. I know that um, Japan is looking into it, Israel is looking into it, There's a, there are a lot of countries who are looking into it, but no one wants to be the first one to, you know, uh, make everyone uh, free, so uh, once we get regulated in one country, everything will be okay. What I see is that most countries go to Switzerland. Now, going into Switzerland is very problematic. Has anyone here invested in Filecoin? Filecoin? No? Okay, so how Filecoins 
investment work is similar to Ethereum. They set up a nonprofit in Switzerland, and the nonprofit bought off the IP from a US company and paid the US company for development. They said that once you contribute to the nonprofit, then the nonprofit's board of directors will recommend that you'll get some tokens, but they can't be certain that these tokens will work later on. <coughs> That's how it works in Switzerland. There's one Swiss law firm that specializes in it. I think that they're the guys that also did the Ethereum ICO. Yep. Uh, they're good guys, but I don't like this model because you lose all the option of being profitable. You have to turn into a nonprofit. Now, it kills a lot of your motivation if you can't be a for-profit and then go to the stock exchange and do a real IPO later on in the game. Yeah, I think it's not a, a sustainable model because you're bending the rules basically. You're, you're saying that you're a non-profit entity even though you own tokens and you distribute tokens which means that in the end you are a for-profit entity. So it, it won't last. I, even if no, it's, it's working but it's, it's not even sure that the, the ICOs that are organized now won't be, uh, won't be punished later. But even, even if it's the case, it, it won't last forever. That's, that's for sure. Is an exchange of token taxable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's a draft by the Israeli tax authority that's uh, horrible. It says <laughs> that any transaction you do in Bitcoin, you have to write down and pay taxes for the specific uh, transaction. Meaning that if you paid me today with Bitcoins, when Bitcoin uh, was worth $4,000, and tomorrow I go and buy falafel, when Bitcoin is 4100 I have to pay taxes on the extra uh, two and a half percent I made off during that day. Now, this goes even if I exchange a token for token because I haven't. I left the the walled garden and exchanged. Yep. But this is a draft. We assume that um, in the few in the upcoming weeks we'll see another uh, draft that's less harsh and will say that you have to pay your taxes yearly and that the taxes would be something like um, property tax which is 25% on gains and not cap and not revenue tax which is 50% and I think that personal use, I hope that personal use would be exempted but we're not certain yet. Yeah, just to, um, to clarify, in France now um, you are exempt from VAT if you're exchanging euros against cryptocurrencies and, and it is very game. likely that it's the same for crypto versus crypto exchanges that's how all the exchanges work by, by the way in Kraken and everything they never apply VAT so basically the, we have good uh, arguments to say that the VAT exemption that has been ruled by the EU tribunal um, is applicable to crypto versus crypto exchanges Exactly. The rule is that uh, it is the case if you. Yeah. It has to be a mean of payment, a moyen de paiement. If it's not, uh, then you have. Yeah. You have a, a big issue. Um, and today it's not uh, something that was treated by the exchanges. You have uh, exchanges today that are exchanging tokens that are not used as mean of payments and they do not apply to VAT. So it's unclear whether uh, it will lead to massive uh, reassessments but, but, in the okay. future or not. <laughs> but if your token is for use of a specific service, let's say yeah. for storage of files, then it should include the VAT yeah. inside because it's an actual service and not a cryptocurrency. Mm. Um, I have a question about the profit and the profile of the company or the profile of the project you want to finance with the ICO. Uh, when I listen to you, you seem to imply that it has to be very early stage project. 
uh, you seem to say that uh, the project has to have a strong link with the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Why could you just <coughs> finance a mature company? You could finance a, a pivot or an extension. And why, why couldn't you finance a project that has nothing to do with blockchain? Okay. Um, that's how the things work now. So most of the ICOs, almost all ICOs, are organized by very early stage projects and they are financing blockchain projects because um, people who are financing, who are buying the tokens are cryptocurrency enthusiasts and they are more likely to finance a blockchain project than a project that is no linked with blockchain. Um, and it's much easier <coughs> to design a token which makes sense uh, for the buyers if you're actually developing a blockchain project because the token is on the blockchain uh, than if you're uh, creating a project that has no link whatsoever with blockchain because then you have the, the issue of what's, what's the token, what are you selling exactly and if you are linking this token with something in, in real life like uh, a real asset or something like that. How do you guarantee uh, the link between the token you're, you're selling and the, the asset you're promising you will be linking the, the token with? So it's, it's, it's less likely, likely to attract the community, but there's yep. no real uh, obligation. Uh, no, there's it, no... It's because you need a, a trustless environment. You need blockchain where you have no trust be between people. If you go back 10 years, there was e-gold. I don't know if you heard about it. There was this guy who said, well, I have a warehouse, it's very protected, I have tons of gold inside, and I will sell you one ounce of gold that will be in my warehouse, and you can sell your e-gold, which is a bill saying that you have one ounce of gold in his warehouse, to another person and use it as a mean of payment. It's centralized. It's an ICO. It's a sell sale of an asset, but it, it needs trust. When you develop a blockchain project, you, you, you go trustless. You say, I don't need a centralized exchange or I don't need a centralized server to trust that my project will work. And therefore, even if the staff of that token will fail, I can still go write my open source code and go ahead with that project without any trust. Now, that's why you need blockchains for it. You don't need a blockchain uh, to replace your bank. You do need a blockchain to replace all banks. Mm. So that, yeah, that's that's the original idea, and that's why uh, all the projects that are trying to uh, basically tokenize real life assets, tokenize real life projects that are or that are pre-existing to the blockchain technology, are uh, more likely to be uh, considered as. Uh, well, it, it will be much more difficult to, to convince someone from the blockchain community to invest in this kind of project. And that's because you have this single point of failure, which is your company. Mm -hmm. And if a company go, goes, goes bankrupt, basically the token won't be worth anything anymore. And if the, the link you're doing between the assets and the, and the tokens is not legal or is considered as being a security on everything, then you are at risk and the investors are at risk. So it's not that it's not possible, it's just much more complicated. Yeah. You want to ask? Um, I'm wondering uh, about regulation, not only ICO regulation, but cryptocurrency regulation. Some coins uh, uh, are known for their anonymity. Is that possible to have regulation, but keeping that anonymity? Well, uh, the US Supreme Court has issued, I think, six or seven rulings relating to file sharing, saying that these websites are legal. It was a Grokster, Napster, LimeWire, ISO Hunt, but st people still share files. Um, Having a law saying that um, you can't pay for m uh, money laundering activities will exist forever. The problem is whether you get caught or not. So if, if you want to circumvent the law with something, you can try. As I see it, 
having anonymous coins like Zcash and Dash only means that there's more room for companies like Chainalysis, but for Zcash, companies that will do know your customer, anti-money laundering, and more uh, help for regulators, and still maintain your anonymity. Uh, because you want this room for startups, you want entrepreneurs, you want innovation, and it, it, it challenges the law, but it doesn't replace it yet. Yeah, but basically that, that's not because the, the transactions are anonymous that the actors using those cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. are outside the field of the law. Uh, you should have uh, this, this TED talk by Kate Hegel. Hegel, I think the the she's from Coinbase today. Uh, from Coinbase, yeah. Uh, she was the federal <coughs> prosecutor who caught the two FBI agent who st agents who stole the money from Dread Pirate Roberts in the Silk Road. Now she explains exactly how she caught them, even though they used uh, money. Uh, transfer services, they used uh, mixers. Um, mixers and other services to hide their identity, but they were still caught in the end. There's also, if you're into reading um, po uh, poorly written or hard academic papers, there's uh, an, a paper by Dorit Ron and Adi Shamir uh, from the Weizmann Institute that try to uh, locate rate pirate Roberts using um, transactions on the blockchain. It's from 2013, but um, they find how many unique addresses could be used in order to specify a, sp uh, a person, and they they offer a method to specifically identify people on the blockchain. It, it's more mathematical, but it, it's not that long, but it, it requires some math. I have a question that is maybe a bit technical from a different perspective, but today what I can see in the US is that tokens are considered like stocks on the balance sheet. And uh, usually um, my big concern is about tokens that have been created but not sold. What is la contrepartie, the other part of that entry? Because you are creating mm. from scratch. Mm. Uh, value or yeah. assets, but usually, from a different perspective, in, most country, in all countries, we've got a little reverse part. So, what is the reverse part if it has not been booked as a revenue because you sold them? That's what Kick did in their ICO. Kick left something like 30% for the development team in the Kick Foundation mm -hmm. that will be used over three or four years. This means that in the books, it's written as equity. And because the company holds it and it has value, means that there's actual room, but I don't think it's taxed. It will be taxed <coughs> if it's used. No, but they have created something, but what is the other value? Yeah, but be yeah. because when but you invest, when you buy a kick token, yeah. it represents uh, the whole ecosystem and the value of the whole ecosystem. You buy only 70% of that system, so the price per token reflects the, the amount mm. that you want to leave within kick yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how you could register it in a, in a French accounting uh, perspective yeah probably probably, yeah. probably yeah. obviously Oh. Uh, how, how do you register the unallocated mm. stock mm. options mm. it's the same mm, yeah but, well <laughs> Um, the, the, the part of the active. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, it's like. Yeah, it's it's like they are selling the part of the token issued, but not all of them. Yeah. They yeah. Keep some of them yeah. To fit with the project. Right. Yeah. So and I think usually they're, they're registered from, from, uh, with their uh, cost of uh, creation, which is okay, nil. Cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is not sold exists, still. Mm. À partir du moment où ça existe, ça devrait être mis en, en, en stock. Oui. Et donc, en phase de ce, de ce stock qui n'est pas euh, vendu, on devrait oui. constater un produit. C'est stock, produit pour les réserves, pour, pour les jetons qui sont gardés en réserve par l'entreprise. Oui. oui. C'est bah, du stock produit par l'entreprise qui, a priori, devrait être enregistré pour son coût de revient. Et le voilà. coût de revient du token, euh, c'est pratiquement zéro, c'est un euro. Bah, c'est la valorisation du token. 
C'est non, c'est pas le coût de revient ça. Ça c'est la valeur de marché. C'est ce qui fait que tout le monde veut faire des IT, ouais. <rire> <rire> Et parce que le, le coût de revient du token, c'est le coût que j'ai mis pour le créer. Et le coût que j'ai mis pour le créer, c'est le, le salaire du technicien qui a créé le smart contract. Pour son okay. Et la vente, la vente des produits, la vente des tokens au, mmh. au public. Là pour le coup, c'est du. Comme du chiffre d'affaires. Oui, mais c'est du chiffre d'affaires pour un produit. Enfin, pour une blockchain qui va être, euh, enfin, le, le, les jetons vont être utilisés sur la blockchain qui n'est pas encore forcément créée. Donc, c'est un, un produit qu'on s'est fait d'avance. Ça, ça dépend, ça dépend du projet. Dit, ça dépend du projet parce que. Ouais. Alors, c'est pas tout à fait terminé, de Raider. Mais oui, c'est enfin. En fait, ce qu'on peut dire de façon générale, euh, sorry, uh, non, non, okay. um, ce qu'on peut dire de façon générale, c'est que pour l'instant, euh, sur le plan comptable et sur le plan fiscal, absolument rien n'est fixé. Donc, on est en train d'explorer de, des possibilités pour tenir compte de la nature extrêmement volatile euh, des tokens, du fait que la réalisation, que la vente, en fait. On pourrait considérer qu'elle n'est réalisée qu'au moment où on convertit les crypto-monnaies reçues en actifs sur non-attribution ou un service. Euh, maintenant, les normes comptables telles qu'elles existent aujourd'hui euh, ne permettent pas très facilement de prendre en compte cet aspect particulier, euh, voire euh, en fait ne sont vraiment pas du tout adaptées pour prendre en compte cet aspect particulier des ICO. Donc, euh, les, les, les pistes qui sont explorées pour l'instant tordent un peu les règles euh, dans l'attente finalement d'un règlement comptable euh, qui, qui ne serait tardé mais qui ne va pas arriver dans les deux mois qui viennent parce que c'est des choses qui prennent, euh, qui prennent du temps. Donc euh, dans l'intervalle, euh, on fait preuve d'un peu d'inventivité en espérant euh, que ça se passe bien à la fin. Mais... <rire> voilà. Juste par exemple sur l'ICO en cours de Domrider, mmh. dans le... Dans leur document, ils provisionnent 80% de la valeur vendue. Oui. Comment, sur quelle base on peut se dire on provisionne 30% des, des jetons ou pas C'est une excellente question. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, moi, au 31 décembre, la clôture d'un exercice comptable. Token as jeton like Yes, exactement. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Uh, uh, on peut ajuster le résultat de l'entreprise comme moi. J'achète. Euh, non, normalement, normalement, on ne peut pas. En décembre, je la provisionne à 80%, je la revends le 1er janvier. Et... Non. Euh, en fait, oui, c'est ça. C'est qu'en fait, pour passer une provision. Euh, déjà il faut trouver quel type de provision on va passer parce que ça dépend de la nature de l'actif donc si on l'a mis en stock a priori c'est une dépréciation de stock euh, mais après il faut pouvoir la justifier et justifier une dépréciation de stock c'est pas facile du tout euh, en normes comptables et puis il faut que ce soit aussi déductible sur le plan fiscal parce que si elle est déductible que sur le plan comptable ça sert à rien Oui. Mais nous parlons de règlementation et nous parlons de règlement 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 de income tax for the actual sell, sale of the token because the token itself is a product and you might be, a, be required to pay value added tax, VAT or GST or whatever tax and then on top of that you will have to do know your customer because if someone comes and buys 50,000 euro worth of tokens you have to identify him to make sure he's not using this token for money laundering. Now all of this if it's a decentralized platform, it doesn't have to be uh, in effect because if it's decentralized, it's a peer-to-peer -peer payment, there's no central party receiving the payment, and the allocation is not made in expectation of profit, <coughs> then most likely these tokens will not be required to be, uh, uh, to be entered into tax. Now, what some startups do is set the value of each token as a specific currency, like USDT. In that case, the token will not increase or decrease over time, then there's no expectation of profit. You don't have to do actual uh, payment of taxes, and the anti-money laundering uh, 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 requirements are made through the exchanges, not through the actual first issuers. Okay, it just 
to precise it's it's, it's yeah it's i think <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think this reasoning will, will work in france <laughs> but yeah uh, but, yeah but, but you have laws on how people should write their names on their mailboxes yeah and what, what they should eat for breakfast <laughs> so yeah we don't have actually this but <laughs> the mailboxes how to write your name it's a municipal order in uh, paris maybe yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's okay, Nidra. <laughs> sea is considered a fish under the fishing act, and you're allowed to fish it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't hear you. Could you repeat? Okay. When you've got an ICO in Israel and you've got developers and you want to pay them with a token, is are those token considered as revenue and do you have to pay social taxes on them, or what? What do you do usually? Well, first, yeah. you're assuming that all your developers are employees and not contractors, so uh, that you have to pay them social benefits. You don't have to pay everyone social benefits under law, only if they're your direct employees. If it's a contractor, then you pay them and you can barter. I can uh, accept gold from a client if I'm a freelancer. I can accept hay. I can accept milk, mm -hmm. nuts. I don't care what, as long as it has specific value. But if I'm an employee under Israeli law, I have to be paid with cash. Israeli cash, shekels, not dollars, not euros not any other currency. So that would be illegal to pay employees of that project in any token, not just Bitcoin yeah. uh, or Ethereum. Yeah, it's exactly the same in France. You have to pay in cash your salaries. But if you are an, ex an external advisor and an independent contractor, then you can accept any kind of payment. And then you are responsible for declaring these revenues and uh, Basically, if you receive tokens, they have a counter value in euros, and you're supposed to declare this as a revenue. But is it in, 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 in the United States, there is a, I don't know, I think I've heard a case where they pay people in Bitcoin. There are a lot of companies in the US that pay people in Bitcoin. Yeah. However, I'm not certain that they are direct employees. Most likely, that they are contractors because mm -hmm. some people work in a different state and in the US also there's a different kind of social benefit unlike here, unlike Israel I don't think you have to pay pension for employees mm -hmm. or uh, deduct taxes at source you pay taxes at the end of the year you don't have to do stuff like uh, health insurance in most cases in Israel you do have to pay your employees health insurance so it's different. You, you both said that most of the ICOs so far were crap. So um, speculative cryptocurrency allotment market. Okay, S C A M. <laughs> Very easy <laughs> to remember. <laughs> so um, do you have example of solid project and solid ICO process that has happened recently that we could look at and, and try to replicate? I think that Bancor is a good example. They have a good idea, a good token. I think they raised too much money. I think Bancor, they, they did a liquidity reserve program for smart contracts. They actually want to have a, a total decentralized way to exchange. I think that um, raising 300 million uh, US dollars is too much for th this. Uh, seed startup, but it's a good idea. These are good guys, reliable, very interesting guys. I also think that uh, uh, the um, MadeSafe, which was a long time ago, MadeSafe uh, ICO was a good idea, and the storage and Filecoin's idea is good. I, I might not like the way it was done, but Filecoin is a good idea on doing an ICO, not legally, <coughs> but uh, technologically. Yeah, yeah. If you have a decentralized solution <laughs> for a decentralized problem, an ICO would be the solution. If your solution could be centralized, then you don't have to go blockchain. You, you can go high tech, raise money very easily from US uh, VCs. They give away money almost, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can say, 
too easily for people who come with a nice idea and know how to dress. Uh, all you have to do is like a t-shirt, jeans, casual clothes, go there, uh, a few buzzwords, deep learning, AI, uh, big data, blockchain, and, and you get a check at the end of your meeting. Don't worry. But, but if, if you want to do an ICO, you actually have to sit down, write a white paper, and some people actually read that white paper. Uh, but um, if you have a decentralized problem, then a trust generating blockchain is the solution. Think of Bitcoin as a good ICO. Bitcoin was not an ICO. Mm -hmm. Ethereum was, and Ethereum succeeded. Ethereum is a good example on how to do an ICO. And the fact of the matter is, you, if you invested in Ethereum back in 2014, mm -hmm. um, you'd have it's times 1,000 mm -hmm. on your money, right? Yeah, I guess so. Well, we would likely be a, million, a millionaire now. And do you have French examples? Uh, French examples. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I exec was a sound project, or is a sound project, technically. Um, it was a very early ICO in terms of organization, so I wouldn't recommend to create an ICO exactly in the same terms today, because things have evolved a lot. Even if in, in the community, the uh, community um, is waiting for more uh, preparation and more steps and then most of the serious ICOs today organize some kind of QAC, organize some kind of, you know, uh, proof of uh, seriousness in the organization themselves. So you have to look at the tec technology itself, but also at how the ICO is organized, basically. And uh, I think iExec was a very good example of a sound technology project uh, with an ICO that was organized with whatever the means they had. Uh, so probably if they had to organize it now, they wouldn't organize it the same, exactly the same way. Um, and I don't see another example in France. I'm kind of uh, confused that we are comparing uh, VCs with ICOs. Yeah. Because most ICOs will not put any stake on the company. Yes. On yeah. the VCs, they are pushing money, they are taking risk, but at the end, they have a, a share of the company. Yep. So, so that, that's, that's why the ICO makes more sense if you're by building a decentralized project or a token that has a real value because uh, makes any doesn't make any sense if you don't have that, basically. Um, because if you don't have shares in the company, you, you have to own something that has a value in another way so basically a part of the product a part of the revenue of the product something that makes sense for the investor the, the if you don't have it ICOs were shares that's what why people think of it ICO is like the IPO people sold shares in fake companies yeah. with the blockchain technology that's why we're comparing it to VC yeah, but, but th that's true that you, you cannot say that it's exactly the same and that's why IPOs and ICOs is not, not, not at all the same thing because uh, basically an IPO uh, is relying on the, on the law system of the legal system of the, of the country. You're buying shares of a company that exists only legally and uh, you, to, get, to, to get money you have to use your, your right on the company and you, you get dividends or something like that. Uh, basically, in, a, in an ICO, you can have a token that is programmed to grant you a benefit, so you don't have to rely on the legal system of the, of the, of the country where the ICO takes place. It's not always the case, but that's the original idea. It's that you, you don't have to trust the legal system of the, of the country you're buying the, the products from. But it's true that it's not how ICOs are organized today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's some kind of crowdfunding, yeah. Some kind of crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. Even even if the projects usually ban 
private investors to but in practice it's, it's almost just IV, exclusive. I'm over 18 yeah. I have to over two million dollars and, yeah. and, and I'm not uh, a US citizen and I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you say that uh, people buying ICOs today are more the traders or people enthusiastic about the cryptocurrency? I think you have, hackers, you have different kind of investors. Yeah. You have uh, some kind of blockchain VCs yeah. that have emerged and uh, in some kind of, uh, of, of uh, ICOs usually they, they pre-buy some, kind, some, some a part of the tokens with a discount. It's uh, funds like Pandera Capital, some Pandera Capital and everything. So there are institutional investors converted to, to blockchain assets, basically. Um, you have uh, the traditional uh, ICO investors, which are the cryptocurrency enthusiasts, people who have invested early on and they have a lot of money today and they try to diversify it and finance projects that they find interesting. And you have newcomers that are people who heard about ICOs, and who say, okay, uh, I can make uh, plus uh, 100%, 1,000% uh, on, on my adrenal investments because it worked with Ethereum, so it will work with any scammy token I will find on the internet. And usually those people lose money, of course. Um, so, yeah. I, I think that these are people who think they already missed the Ethereum hype and the Bitcoin yep. hype and they say, well, B Bitcoin is almost at 5,000, it won't go much more. I can make 20%, 30% on my money, I want to double it. And they're looking for high risk investment with expectation of profit. Yep. Now, Bitcoin by itself is very dangerous as an investment. It's not something to be considered lightly when you put money in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Now, if you want to go and increase that, you can go and buy Litecoin, Peercoin, Dogecoin, uh, Siacoin. Um, yeah, basically uh, any other. Yeah, I, I think I have like Terra coins, uh, Jewel coins, things I mined like back in 2013 when Bitcoin mining became not that profitable. Some of them triple their, their value, some of them lo lost all their value, but people are looking in ways to have more Bitcoins without putting more money in. Because all the ICOs are attached to a Bitcoin value, not to a US dollar or Euro value. So you mentioned the VC is pretty new. Uh, it does like a lot of crap. Um, VCs don't invest in Bitcoin, regular VCs, no, no, limited no, no, partnerships. No, no, no. It's well. guys who uh, have but it's, money it's, from it's, it's changing basically. Uh, yeah. Today we have at least one or two funds in France who are invested in Ether, Bitcoin, and other B Ethereum based token. Uh, but it's, it's investments that they consider highly very the, 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 big, the biggest risk they can take, basically. So it's like. Uh, Spare money. <laughs> that you, you just buy a bit, a bit of token, and if it works, then jackpot. But yeah. Well, if I do an ICO in France, but yeah. the law kicks in six months after, and actually, yeah, I don't really like. I don't really buy by the law in my previous ICO. What yeah. does happen? Is it retroactive or? Um, basically, if you if you respected your investors and you made your projects uh, with a lot of sense and you took a bit of advice with a lawyer and a tax specialist and everything, uh, I think you, you should be safe. But I cannot guarantee it. Um, but it doesn't mean that your uh, token holders will be able to trade the token legally later on. That's yeah. the problem. I mean, you'll be fine, but no one will use the token, so the value will go down. Mm. Still, there, there, there's still that war. one reason to, uh, to go for an ICO. Uh, I think it's Clément Janot who did a, a short video, very interesting, where he developed that idea that an ICO also help uh, uh, um, uh, early, early stage projects yeah. also to, to build a fan base of, of, of investors, but mm -hmm. also of people who will uh, help the project to go viral. Yeah. And, and it's very important for a lot of services. Yeah. 
There yes, are yes. A lot of that, good that's ICOs that's a good that's smart. that's a good that's a good side of ICOs, of course. Yeah, yeah. you create a community uh, very involved with yeah. is your project. Yeah. But so you can do that with an airdrop. You don't have to put. You get money from VC, and then you airdrop tokens, create a community, mm -hmm. and then when you already have a community, you go for a round B, get more money from a VC, airdrop a, a whole lot more of tokens. Someday people will use your service, pay fees, you'll get a revenue, you'll exit, VC money will be uh, doubled, your money will be tripled, everything is okay, no ICO, no issues with US regulators that no one wants to deal with. Y you still want to be able to fly to the US when you want to, <laughs> and dealing with ICOs that might be, illegal, might be legal here, but illegal in the US, might get you on the no-fly list to the U.S., so I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, do not deal with the feds. It's a big issue. <coughs> that's, that's one of the reasons why the, the token sales today are more and more going through a very extensive KYC process, where they really ensure that the investors are not U.S. citizens, because this way they can really do say that they have they done all they could do to exclude the US citizen. It's not just a checkbox that they, they put on their website. Uh, I forgot to uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you are moving into a project with uh, an exchange to list assets. Yeah. Is that a small possible Okay, <laughs> with pleasure. Uh, yeah, well, b basically, we'll be developing a platform to create derivative products in, in blockchain. So, um, it's products that are used to cover exchange risks or any other financial risks on the blockchain. Um, but so, it's like traditional derivative products that are used by um, investors to, for example, if you buy. Uh, 100 eaters, or you organize an ICO, basically. You organize an ICO, you get a 1,000 eaters, but you're afraid that the value of the eater will drop, and then, the value, and then you will have to pay tax on something that you don't have anymore and everything. Then you can hedge your risk by subscribing to a derivative product through a traditional bank or something like that, an insurance, basically. Uh, the objective of the platform is to create this, but on blockchain directly, decentralized, secured, and with uh, using the very low cost and the very low latency of the blockchain. Yeah, I mean, I sell you yeah. the risk, so it's, it's... So, yeah, the first version of the product will be entirely peer-to-peer, -peer, so you have... So it's not like on your next, where right? you have a different level of memberships and then you have the clearinghouse, right? No, so everything is settled on blockchain. You use only cryptocurrencies as, uh, as, as products. So there's and no risk of default? No. Whatever the market will do? Yeah. So basically, the only thing you can do is lose all your money and you're liquidated, or you gain to double of the money you put and you're liquidated. It's That's different. the first version it's of the product. To stocks .com. Yeah, uh, but, uh, it's, it, but, but it's really... But it's not for gambling, but for... Yeah, for exactly. Yeah. The objective... How you frame it. W the, w the project was originated in a, in a project to create a stable token. So in, in, the, in the beginning, what we wanted to create is a token that is always uh, equal to one euro to one dollar, so you can hedge your risks by buying this token. And basically what we realize is that the most efficient way to create a stable token is to create derivatives. So we changed the product to uh, basically derivative, a, uh, a huge derivative market. And we will create those stable tokens as derivative products, basically in the next few months. So you will be regulated by the uh, IMF? Um, I, in the first step, no because we're not dealing with money. That's the good part. Um, but we will, of course, in the next few months. So we are in active discussion with them to help them create the regulation, explain how we will do our best to protect the investors and everything, uh, because that's what we want to do. The IMF is not only, uh, they, they like, they want to report every day about yeah. elections. Yeah, but that's very easy with yeah. blockchain, you know? Blockchain. Everything is on the blockchain. <laughs> Will it be based on, on Ethereum or what? Yeah, it's an Ethereum based project. And, uh, and all the derivatives are on smart contracts. You're not financing through an SEO? No. <laughs> no, we're not. Uh, big, that's because we didn't find any suitable world for a token in our product now. It's, there, is no, there is no place for a token. So if 
in the next version we find something that makes sense with the token we might consider an ICO but now we, we're trying to find traditional investors to and how do you get your data for the smart contracts themselves? We, we are doing our you, Oracle services. The provider, yeah. I mean, we will be the, the data provider from the, for the price feed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a huge uh, part of the product development is on the price feed to create a, a reliable price feed. I <coughs> need to explain to them. Yeah. Um, I, I agree to sell him 100 Ether for $1. Yeah. Um, uh, we need to know that at a certain point of time what the price of Ether is. In a trustless environment, you need a trusted third party to give you the feed yep. with the data. Uh, it's a problem if we can't agree on the data provider or if there's a technological breakdown. So you do need a trusted feed to agree on. And that's, uh, that yep. was my question. Because even if the, 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 decent, the, the, um, the derivative product is completely decentralized on the blockchain with smart contracts and everything, the blockchain is not capable of, of looking at the price, basically. So you have to, to put the, the data yourself in the smart contracts, and that's one, one of the roles we will be playing. But this happened in the Forex days back in 2000, where the Forex platform were making swings of the price because yeah. they were data provider. Uh, yes, but we are not counterparties, so we don't have any interest of doing this. But if you make the market swing, uh, you can find ways. I assume well, that in version 2 you'll be yeah. able to choose your own <laughs> feed and that... Yeah, but basically the, 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 the data providers for the price, it's not us. We are, we are collecting the data <coughs> from sources. from. Yeah, well, the Kraken. It, yes, <laughs> in, in the decentralized world, it's exactly it's Kraken, it's Poloniex, and everything. Yeah. And we are doing it in a, in a technical way that demonstrates that we are, we, do, we do not tamper the data. So, so like we just moving average of the prices. Yeah. So we have a lot of uh, developments, technological developments, uh, doing uh, right now. But yes, for now we are doing it very simply by f fetching the data in like ten different price feeds and doing a, a, an average uh, of those feeds and then putting it on the blockchain. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you.